So today's talk, we're going to just be speaking on the different device types. Um, so I, I know many of you probably already know this information, but I think it's always helpful to have a review of the different devices. I also peppered in a little bit of details about um, newer devices coming into the market um, and then the basic concepts and makeup of those. Um, just to clarify, my name is AJ Hale. I know and have met many of you already, but for the ones who I haven't, I look forward to it. Um, I have uh, a certified cardiac device specialist working out of Boston, but I try to come to uh, to visit y'all on the continent as often as I can. So, uh, so yeah, we'll start with device types. Uh, then we'll go over the uh, in uh, NBG code, um, and then from there we can move on to the basics of. Um, of capture and non-capture. Like I said, it will be a little bit of a recap for many of you, but uh, the idea of these lectures is that we're going to continue to build with complexity. So, um, you know, if if it did, makes too much sense, you know, feel free to, to sit back and just get the review. And if you're trying to learn along the way, you know, we're here to help. Raise your hand, uh, reach out in the chat, and we'd love to hear your opinions, thoughts, experiences as we go here. Um, you know, we're trying to learn from each other. And uh, yeah, it will, if it's easy now, it's probably not going to stay that way. And if it's complex now, we're here to help. Just let us know. So we are almost 10 past. I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, and then Jules, like I said, feel free to chime in uh, as, as my uh, co-host today and just let me know how I can help. So as far as device types, um, for implantable cardiac devices, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the transvenous type. So you have single chamber pacemakers, dual chamber, biventricular or CRTD, uh, CRTP devices. Same thing with defibrillator, CRTD, defibrillator, CRTP pacemaker, um, as well as single and dual chamber. There's also implantable loop recorders. You may or may not have those in your markets yet, but they, uh, they're coming down the pike if you don't have access already. Um, there is leadless pacemakers. This is the newest innovation that has come out in the last five years or so. Um, and uh, all device companies are kind of experimenting or bringing their own to market. So you're going to continue to see these as they uh, proliferate the market. And then you have subcutane subcutaneous um, ICDs as well. And I know Dr. Dafa, you've been asking about this one quite a bit. Uh, so I wanted to, to show everyone this as well because um, many may not be familiar of it. So uh, transvenous permanent pacemakers, uh, you may see them as PPMs. Um, we have our single chambers. I didn't actually display a single chamber, but imagine this one with one less lead. Uh, Jules, can you see my um, cursor, by the way, just so I know? Yeah, yes, I can, AJ. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Okay, so um, you have, this is a dual chamber displayed. Um, single chamber, very similar, just for the dual, you have one in the atrium and then one in the ventricle. This one looks like it's pretty close to the apex there, which is pretty standard for transvenous placement, but um, there are new types and placements that we will go down the road, like left bundle, uh, his bundle, which has kind of fallen out of popularity, but still in circulation. We also have biventricular, uh, bi-V pacemakers or cardiac resynchronization therapy, CRTP devices. So if you hear someone say biventricular or CRTD, CRTP, they mean the same thing. There are gonna be three leads, um, one in the uh, atrium, one in the ventricle, and then one that is going to go through the coronary sinus and pace, um, pace kind of uh, semi-epicardially there in the in the vasculature of the heart. Um, you also may have external leads as well. I didn't picture any of these. I have some later in the presentation, but it doesn't have to be inside the um, inside the vasculature. You can also pace externally. Um, you know, through epicardial leads. So I don't have any display, but I'll show you later. Um, you really can't click on this during the presentation, but I've included some links that may be helpful to go over some of the things we talk about. So uh, feel free when I send this presentation out to click through it. Um, as far as the device makeup for your uh, pacemakers, it's very simple. Well, I'll make it very simple. It's actually much more complex, but uh, you have your device header where the leads will actually plug into the device. So um, usually these are uh, polyurethane, you can see through it. Um, then you have your circuit board. This is the brain of the device. Um, this is all fully encapsulated. So there's no ingress of fluid, which can cause damage to it. And then finally, typically at the bottom, you have uh, your battery and that is what charges and powers the whole device. Um, you know, I, I thought about doing a presentation on the history of devices. 
Um, I, it's really interesting, but I don't know if it's necessarily relevant, but it may help for you to do some reviews. So there's some really cool, you know, uh, technological changes over the years. The original ones were obviously much larger. They had to be placed um, in the uh, in the stomach typically or, you know, uh, in the chest area, but not, not in the upper chest. Um, and they've become much smaller, much more streamlined over time. There's even some nuclear devices for a while. Um, you may, <laughs> they may still be kicking around because they'll last forever, but um, the newer ones have become much more simplified and much smaller and um, typically placed uh, up up here just to uh, to keep it out of the way. And it's because it's easy access. As far as going over access, device placement, and things like that, I will let the physicians talk you through it. Um, I'm not here to tell you how to implant. I'm just telling you how they work. So next we move on to ICDs. ICDs are you. just, yes, sir. Really, really quickly, mm -hmm. um, a question in the chat group from Dr. Daffy about, say, so um, he says, what, what of left bundle, branch, Payson? Mm -hmm. um, I think, where will you place it as types? I think. Yeah, so so left bundle. Um, so I, I don't want to get too deep into this just because I think it's a much more complex talk. Um, but, I, and we're definitely going to do another one. We had, uh, Dr. Sharif present on it earlier on this summer, and we're going to go back over it again, but for left bundle, you're actually trying to, um, you know, reach the conduction pathway on the left side. So you're going to take your RV lead and drill into the septum, trying to activate the left bundle. The idea being that, um, you know, you're working with the heart's own conduction pathway, which is, uh, more streamlined and allows for a, uh, a more narrow pace complex and better cardiac tissue engagement. So uh, that would be a left bundle device, uh, left bundles, uh, left bundle area pacing, his bundle, which is kind of this connection right here. Um, those devices, typically you can use a standard pacemaker. You just have to program it a little differently, but the actual generator itself isn't special. It's just the placement of the lead that matters. Um, historically, you know, we just go for this um, apical placement, people started to go more septal, arguing that maybe you get a little bit more natural, uh, narrow complex, and then um, his bundle came along, and then finally left bundle, which is, like I said, drilling into the septum. Um, would not recommend doing that without a proctor teaching you, because it's very um, higher risk, I would say, if you if you don't have experience uh, doing it. And, um, you know, you want to be talked through the process, but uh, I see those procedures are take about as long as a normal dual chamber. So it's definitely a um, a good uh, solution down the road and we will have somebody give a talk about it. Um, looks like Dr. Dothra is actually asking about temporary pacing as well. Uh, so temporary pacemakers, you know, um, I assume you mean like an IJ or what kind of pacemaker are you talking about? Like um, interjugular access, are you talking about more of an inferior access? While well, he contemplates this, uh, temporary pacing is just an option as a bridge. Um, so say you have a patient that will not need a permanent pacemaker, but may need it for a short period of time. You have the ability to uh, either to float a temporary pacing lead in and um, and pace. Sometimes they'll use, you know, uh, IJ access, thread the lead down. And it's, it's similar to uh, how we use a dual chamber pacemaker or single chamber pacemaker. Uh, but we can kind of go probably deeper on another time, Dr. Dafe, on, on, you know, the different temporary pacing options, but um, it's going to act very similar to a, to a permanent implanted device. Sorry, EJ, can I add really quickly, mm -hmm. um, not to distract from this. So no, go on. Dr. Dr. Dafe, um, so what I've recently uh, found out was that Metron, if you go to Metronic.inc, um, they have a virtual um external pacing like guide if you like mm -hmm. um and virtual epg which is an app which i think i've sent out i don't think i've sent it to you and and um um fcc hospital yet but um all the others have it so if you go to metronic.inc app you'll be able to download um the app now this app is a virtual is a, is a virtual uh, temporary pacing um I think where you can actually go in and and either you want jugular access or femoral access allows you to actually um from if a patient has a complete heart block you can actually pace it by controlling the the voltage the output 
um, you know, the current um, or the um, what sensitivity you want it. Um, mm. It allows you to actually almost like a real one. Um, mm. Nobody's ever done this before, which is absolutely fantastic. You can even see the see the wires going into the heart. Um, you know, um, whether it's coming from the jugular or from the femoral, and it's a really good way for training, um, training people. Um, I keep telling people in hospitals and nurses, and you work in an ICU, who might need it as an emergency, that um, you can certainly um, um, use it and things like that. So, um, Doctor Alajime, this is really useful as well. Um, I think you will have it. You've got it. Um, I loaded it up on your system, so you'll be able to use it for training and things mm. it, it, now so to repeat is that an app or is it web-based uh, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an app yeah sorry it's an okay. app okay so, so they've kind of like gamified it a little that's really cool yeah i'd, I'd love yeah. to to download that yeah it's, it's fantastic I, I was telling everybody i told um, ijuma about it last time and and she said she was going to use it um i thought i'd mentioned it to you aj already but sorry if i haven't <laughs> no no um i i must have missed it last time yeah i'd love to uh I'd love to take a look at it. So if you don't mind sending me the link or I'll, I'll just dig for it yeah. later, but no, that's, that's fantastic. You know, anything, uh, anything we can do to kind of, you know, make this fun and learn as we go, you know, I, I highly recommend it. So perfect. moving along, we have ICDs. So uh, ICDs are very similar in structure to a pacemaker, aside from the fact that it has the ability to distribute or to defibrillate. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because this is more of the low voltage uh, simple presentation. However, I did want to go ahead and you know tell you a little bit about them. So uh, like a pacemaker, you have your header, you have your circuit board, you have your battery uh, here, and then you have your capacitor. So the only difference really uh, structurally, aside from a more complex circuit, um, is is the uh, the capacitor, which allows it to deliver a, a massive charge. Um, if you think about it, batteries are like a tank and there's only so much energy they're able to put out. However, this capacitor is able to take a massive amount of energy, store it, and then release it, allowing it to defibrillate the heart. Mechanisms on defibrillation and all of that, that's another day, but I did wanna go ahead and show you defibrillators. Um, single chamber, dual chamber, this one is a CRT as we discussed. So you have your RV lead, you have your RA lead, and then you have your coronary sinus lead as well, fed down to pace the other side of the heart. The idea being to engage um, as much tissue as possible and try to, um, you know, uh, alleviate some of that dyssynchrony that the patient may have with their electrical conduction system. Moving on, we have ILRs, loop recorders. Um, so you may see it as an ILR. There may be other. I'm not sure what, what you all refer to them as in the UK. Uh, Jules, but the idea of these things is it's kind of produces almost like an EKG, um, like a surface EKG in the fact that it is not inside the heart. It's just tucked underneath the skin sitting above the heart. And you'll have an electrode at one end, an electrode at the other, and it measures um, the electrical impulses across the heart. Um, it's a good way to monitor for uh, things like AFib. Uh, it's also a good way to look for pauses. Um, one problem, you know, we'll have a lot of times with patients, um, say with a Holter, multi Holter monitor, is they're very, you know, short term. Uh, you may not have the best compliance versus this ILR will have many years of life in it. Um, most of the ones in the market are around three to five years now. It's implanted. It monitors the patient all the time. And then it saves EGMs that can be reviewed and associated back with symptoms. So if the patient comes in and says, hey, you know, I've been feeling like I'm passing out lately, syncopal, pre-syncopal, lightheadedness, and then you take a look at their recordings and they're having five second pauses, it's a pretty strong indicator, uh, may have some work to do. So that is something you may see as well. Um, they're not as common across um, Sub-Saharan Africa yet, but I know that uh, Dr. Adafe has planted a few in Abuja, I believe, uh, Dr. Oladimeji has done some in Lagos as well. So you may start to see these. Um, and then later on, you know, they have the ability to integrate with remote monitoring as well. So the patient doesn't have to come in, but um, that is your ILR. Anything on that, Jules? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You, you, you said it all. <laughs> pretty simple. I mean, yeah, they're pretty straightforward, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I have a lot of hospitals, you know, started with Medtronic, so people know them as reveal monitors. Mm -hmm. um, that's another name for it, but yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Perfect. And then we have leadless pacemakers. So uh, Medtronic was the first to come to market with a leadless pacemaker with the Micra. This one displayed here is uh, going to be the Saint or the Abbott Saint Jude of Ver. Uh, this is their dual chamber system. Um, so the original systems were VVI only devices, so pacing in the ventricle only. Um, newer iterations are going to allow for atrial pacing. Um, and you know Abbott is the first to come to market with dual chamber, but they're all you know, coming, coming down the pike. So, um, okay. Yeah. So Dr. Dafe confirmed they've started implanting in, in Abuja and port core So fantastic. Um, so yeah, leadless pacemakers, I, I, there's not really been any in SSA yet, but, um, you know, I'll still start to see them hit the market. Um, big advantages of these, you know, they limit, um, the biggest point of failure being the leads. And we'll go over this later, but lead failure is a common, um, issue with devices that results in them having to be either, you know, extracted or leads added, things like that. So when you get rid of the lead, you address a lot of those issues, uh, reduce infection risk, you know, everything is self-contained in the heart. This is the delivery catheter. This is, um, this releases the device and it's just going to be two devices or one single device um, hanging out in the heart here. So it's it does, um, you know, there's reduced infection risk. Typically the batteries are actually very long on these devices because they're not very complex in what they're able to do. Um, they're very simple devices. So in, in many ways, the batteries last a long time. In the case of the Aver, it uses conductive uh, uh, telemetry, which means that it um, it speaks through the micro pulses in the blood pool. Um, other companies are going to come out with their cool ways of integrating these uh, multiple devices. But okay, and have a good flight, Dr. Kara. Um, and then finally, we have um, upgradability uh, and integration. So as you see things go right now, you know, these are just simple dual and single chamber devices, but down the road, you may see integration with other things like um, cardio MEMS that, that uh, measure like pulmonary pressures. Um, you may see integration with SICDs or other things that, um, that will all reduce patients' infection risk, but still allow for, um, you know, all levels of therapy. So uh, it's going to be cool to see how these things continue to grow, but right now they're just not um, very far outside of the U S and European markets, some disadvantages, they're more complex to implant. It's much more dangerous because you're using a very stout catheter in the heart. And if you don't know what you're doing, you get a little too anterior, you can, um, you can just, uh, perforate. And that's never a good time because these devices are obviously much larger, um, than a typical lead, which means that when you do, it's always going to be a, uh, a CT surgery case, I would say, um, Younger technology, we just don't have as much, um, you know, experience with this tech yet. And, you know, there could always be hiccups down the road that we just don't know. But for now, it's it's looking very promising. Um, and then finally, they're not reprocessable. Um, so I know that a lot of programs are using uh, reprocessed devices to help supplement um, you know, and, and, and address their indigent populations. And right now it doesn't look like these are going to be easy to take out and re-implant. Um, so that is a, a deficit, but something to be aware of. Finally, we have, sorry, sorry. go on. Uh, so that's excellent, AJ. So I was also going to add with the leadless pacemaker that for instance, it's also beneficial if a patient has had like a pacemaker for about 10 years or whatever. So, and then um, something is wrong with maybe one of um, the RV lead, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then they find out, they do a venogram and they find out the veins are blocked and they can't do anything. So they come in very handy. For instance, if the patient is not pacing a lot in their A or is pacing all the time, you can implant, for instance, like a micro AV and it will basically detect the atrial activity and then pace the ventricle. So we've used it a few times, they're becoming really, really handy and, and, um, handy. and it works in conjunction with a previously implanted transvenous device. Um, mm -hmm. and that, so it's quite handy for that. So just to confirm, you're basically saying, turn off the ventricular lead, um, let the micro AV sense the intrinsic conduction coming yes. down, and oh, then yes. you can oh, use is... AI pacing, which we'll get to later. Spot on, spot on. Yeah, that's cool. No, it, it's really, <laughs> I, I've actually seen something similar with a pacemaker and a defibrillator where they had two separate devices 
And yeah. I always thought that was an odd decision because uh, with defibrillators, you don't want it over sensing certain events. But with these kind of things, as you said, it's probably not going to sense the atrial spike. So if you have an atrial lead and a ventricular device, it, you know, generally it'll be okay. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have SICDs. I'll be honest, I have never worked with these before. Um, when I worked for Abbott, they they didn't have a solution. I, they still don't have a solution. Uh, Medtronic is coming out with one. This one, which is sub -xiphoid. This one is a Boston device from the looks of it. The idea being that it's not, um, it's not transvenous. The lead is actually just underneath the skin, kind of tunneled across. Um, and your shock vector just goes across the heart with the can underneath the arm. Um, so it obviously eliminates the risk of vascular injury if you have a patient with occlusion or patients um, who uh, may have higher infection risk. Um, so we we actually saw these a lot in patients with with um, uh, with drug issues as well, just because they may, um, you know, if they're transvenous drugs users, then it's, it's good to avoid putting anything in the vasculature that could get infected. Uh, preserve the venous access, so no risk, no risk of occlusion down the road. And then, um, you know, it avoids the risk of, of complications. It's not anything you have to extract later uh, with a lot of complexity and worried about damaging the vasculature, damaging the heart and causing risk. So, yeah. Yeah, that's from um, Dr. Akuru saying that Medtronic Leeless is passive, and mm -hmm. is active. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so just to review, uh, I guess to I would argue that the 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 Medtronic one is passive in a way, but it actually has like a metal like a, a metal cup that well, a cup. I'm not sure what the cup's made out of that keeps the tines uh, yep. straightened, and okay. then. As you pull the cup back, it actually like hooks. So it's it's passive, yeah, passive-ish. But the uh the Abbott one is is going to be like a true active fixation where you you screw in a helix into the tissue. But maybe my my old device biases are showing. So I'll move along. <laughs> uh, pacing modes and NBG codes. Um uh, we're just keeping this uh this rhyming scheme going from last lecture. So um so NBG stands, uh, you can go ahead and NAFC B, BPEG generic code. Um, if you want to know what those means, I recommend Googling it because I didn't bother to go any deeper. But the idea was that they wanted to, um, you know, just solidify what our pacing scheme is for certain devices, get everyone on the same page regardless, regardless of the manufacturer. So this NBG code is how we codify um, what capability a device has, and then also what a device is programmed to. So um, for example, if you look here at our NBG codes, uh, just to go over it, you have your categories, one, two, three, and four, and then the associated letters, um, what they represent. So your first position, um, is the chamber that it is pacing in. So an O means none, A means it paces in the atrium, V in the ventricle, and dual means in both um, the ventricle and the atrium. Sensing, this is the chamber that it senses in. Same thing, none, atrium, ventricle, or both. Um, and then third position is its response to sensing. So based upon a sensed event, does it do nothing? Does it trigger pacing? Does it inhibit pacing? or does it do both? Um, and then finally, the last one is rate modulation. Um, and they, they've added this on later, but this is just the ability for the device to respond to a um, to uh, a rate modulation, like a sensor driven rate, for example. So for patients with chronotropic incompetence, it allows the device to, um, to pace appropriate, like physiologically appropriate for the patient's need. Um, if the heart doesn't uh, modulate its rate itself, the device can do it for it. So just to give some quick definitions, capture is the ability to deliver enough energy to consistently depolarize the heart. Sensing is the ability to correctly sense intrinsic cardiac activities. Inhibit is withholding of a pace or action upon the sensing of an intrinsic event. Triggering is initiating of a pace or action upon the sensing of an intrinsic event. Any questions here? Perfect. Moving along. All right. So the most simple, and this is the one <laughs> when in doubt, and if the patient is, uh, you know, you're not capturing and you don't know why, um, go VOO and go high output. So um, the idea here is your first position, you're pacing in the ventricle. Um, 
Your second position is O, so none. So that means it is not, I'm gonna stop touching things. Um, it means it is not responding to any kind of sensed event. So regardless of what the device may sense, it doesn't have sensing on at all. It just is completely blind to what's happening. And then uh, the third position, it has no response to any kind of sensing. So it just, even if it was to sense, it's going to do nothing. It just paces no matter what at the set base rate. So if you're set VO 70, it's going to pace at 70 beats a minute um, until you tell it to stop. And this is great. For example, if you have patients going into, uh, who have like electrocardia or electrocardia and is, has um, complete heart block, or if, um, you know, you have patients where the lead is over sensing noise, this allows the device to just continue to pace no matter what, um, making sure that the patient doesn't go without a heartbeat. Uh, for all of us or all of our friends who are taking the uh, IBHRE, I went ahead and just codified these here for you just to show what's going on. Uh, but let me review really quick. Uh, anybody want to take a shot at these different rhythms in the group? Anyone at all? Jules, you feel oh, like it? Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to answer Dr. Ujima's, um, sorry, Dr. Oladjimi's question there. So I'm, I'm busy typing away. Oh yeah, so uh, what's the difference between VVI and VVT? So we will actually get to this, okay. um, but if you look at VVI, it paces in the ventricle, it senses in the ventricle, and based upon a sensed event, it inhibits pacing. Uh, VVT is um, going to be the same. It paces in the ventricle, it senses in the ventricle, and then based upon an intrinsic ventricular activity or something that it senses, it will uh, trigger a pace. So for patients who may have... Um, you know, uh, basically uh, patients, you want to make sure that you're by V pacing all the time. You can turn on VVT and that will allow the device um, when it senses intrinsic event to try to pace into it. Um, I'll let the physicians, you know, debate the efficacy of by V pacing into an, uh, to a sensed event. But the idea is that maybe you're going to get some degree of fusion. Um, other times I've seen VVT used is for um, when patients have a little bit of noise in the lead and complete heart block, um, I've seen physicians make the call to turn on VVT or trigger pacing um, so that it doesn't inhibit pace. It will just pace whenever it senses an event um, below the max track rate, which we'll get to later. So, um, okay. Uh, Dr. Dafe asked the difference between demand pacing and asynchronous demand is just when the when the heart needs it, demands it. And asynchronous, that is your VOO, uh, DOO, AOO types. Um, and that just means that it doesn't respond to sensing um, and it doesn't bother to sense at all. It just paces no matter what at your base rate. So uh, Jules, I, I know I kind of asked you, but I'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so I went ahead and... Oh codified these different um, events here, just because I think VOO is gonna give you the mix of everything. So for example, we have our captured event here. We see a wider complex um, directly following a pace, probably indicates capture. Um, next we have what looks like a P wave and an intrinsic event, and then a pace spike right here. Um, this would be functional non-capture because the, um, if you remember what we were talking about the last couple of weeks, um, you know, if if it's not ready to accept an impulse, it just kind of goes nowhere. So the, the device is pacing, but it, the tissue is in refractory. So nothing occurs. This is functional non-capture. Um, again, we have a, an event here, a P wave, it looks like, and then a V pacing spike right here. Morphologically, it looks very similar to capture. So I would say that we probably beat out the intrinsic conduction from the P wave, and this is just a um, an RV paced event only. Here we have a P wave, a delay, and the device paces. Uh, when you pace, it looks like the morphology is kind of a mix between the intrinsic um, conduction, so very narrow, and the RV pace. When you have this kind of mixed morphology, this indicates fusion. Fusion is when the supraventricular or conduction from above and a ventricular impulse coincide to produce a hybrid complex. Technically, you could have fusion with a PVC as well, but the idea is that basically when you have an intrinsic event fusing with a paste event, you end up having a mixed morphology or a hybrid morphology. Here again, we have functional non-capture. We, we have a P wave. 
it conducts down to the narrow QRS and then we pace, but the tissue is refractory. So we're not able to actually, um, you know, capture anything here. We have a PVC, wide, ugly, uh, once again, PVCs are premature ventricular contractions, extra abnormal heartbeats that begin um, in the ventricles. And then following again, we have a, uh, we have capture here. So um, if you look at this here, if you actually had calipers and you spaced it out, this is the same rate. It doesn't modulate. It doesn't respond to any kind of sensing. It doesn't say, oh, there's an event I need to withhold. It just paces no matter what at the set base rate and it either captures or it doesn't capture. Keep in mind, this can be pro-rhythmic. If you happen to pace at the wrong time, you can uh, induce a uh, arrhythmia. So um, you don't want to leave a patient just set VOO long-term. Um, typically you want to make sure when you're pacing asynchronous that you're pacing above the intrinsic rate. So right here, I would say this is improperly programmed VOO. Um, I would want this patient, or I'd want this device to be pacing above the intrinsic rate if possible, um, because, you know, you're opening yourself up to having, um, pacing into, um, a vulnerable period and setting off an arrhythmia. So typically, for example, if a patient is going into surgery, I'll set them VOO 85, 90, um, if they're underlying rhythms around 60 or so, just to make sure or reduce the instance rate of us pacing into a, um, intrinsic or uh, to suppress PVCs as well that might occur. Let's see, I'm just checking the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, as Dr. Kuro said, typically VVT is not common. I've only ever, I think I've only ever used it in a in a BIV where a doctor wanted to, um, they had like AFib and they wanted to pace into the fib because he felt that he could get uh, more fusion at least or a more narrow complex than the intrinsic uh, bundle branch block that they had or because, um, you know, there, there might be noise over sensing and you're trying to reduce the rate, the uh, instance rate of the device over sensing noise and inhibiting pacing when it really should pace. And, and, EJ, so the algorithm as well, you know, you, know, you mentioned earlier, your, your CRT, like for instance, your Medtronic has got your vSensor response, um, which, which should always be on. Um, and I guess that's kind of VVT, which it triggers on like ventricular topics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it paces even AF as well, that's conducted. Um, you know, it, it, will, it will try to maximize as much pace and increase the pace and percentage as much as possible, mm -hmm. uh, thereby increasing, like um, improving the um, resynchronization of the heart. And whether, whether, like you said, it depends on what the doctors think, whether that actually really works on, you know, doing trigger pacing, it makes any difference in the patient's symptoms. That's obviously debatable, but in, in Medtronic, you have your V-Sense response on, and, and you can actually go in and change the settings as well, the rate, in which you wanted to trigger. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I Yeah. So it's been a while since I've programmed Abbott, but I believe they have something uh, similar to that uh, where it's, you can program the max trigger rate. Um, but with Boston, I don't know if we have a Boston expert that can tell us if they, they should have some sort of, I'm assuming yeah, everyone kind of has. Got it. It, Boston has got yeah. it. It's like trigger piece. Yeah. So yeah. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Medtronic's is maybe a little bit more complex of an algorithm, um, yeah, yeah. maybe a little more robust for uh, for this kind of thing. And then, you know, what happens is a device company comes up with a cool algorithm and everyone else kind of rolls out their version of it uh, within their, you know, um, legal ability. So um, you may end up having, I think every device company will have something very similar in their Vives. Yeah. All right. So uh, brings us to the next, a uh, little bit more complex VVI pacing. So this is a pretty common mode you'll see in single chamber devices or devices in patients with uh, chronic AFib where you've turned off that atrial lead. Um, and what happens is you're just pacing in the ventricle. You're, uh, you're sensing in the ventricle as well, which means you're not paying attention to what the atrium is doing. It may not even have a lead, so it might not be an option. Um, and then as a response to that sensing, it uh, inhibits. So um, in this VVI device, you'll see here that it has a set base rate, and you can see the base rate. Um, 300, 200, anyway, about 60 beats a minute. Um, is your base rate here. But as you can see, you're not seeing these random pacing spikes. You're not seeing these uh, fusion or necessarily or um, functional non-captures occurring. 
you're seeing inhibition of pacing here because the intrinsic rate is going faster than the 60 beats a minute, uh, 300, 150, 75. So about 75. And then um, the timer starts after this sensed event. It waits, nothing occurs. It paces in the ventricle. It waits, nothing occurs. It paces in the ventricle. It waits, a PVC occurs here. You can see it's most likely PVC. We see no preceding P wave. It's wide and ugly complex. Um, this could even be maybe a P right there. But um, the device senses that it withholds pacing, reducing the risk of having, you know, being uh, pro rhythmic and resets the counter at the instance of the sensed event. So somewhere along here, it senses it and says, oh, this is intrinsic. I wait. The timer times out. There's no other ventricular events. It goes back to pacing again. The timer waits and then nothing happens, it paces again. So VVI um, is obviously superior to VOO long-term because it's not prorhythmic and it responds to the intrinsic conduction. You know, with a lot of these devices, we're trying to reduce the amount of RV pacing because, you know, pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy is not ideal. So um, obviously you want to try to program to the highest level of complexity that the device allows that uh, fits the patient. So that is VVI. Any questions there? <clears throat> chime in if you have anything. Uh, next, we have AOO. So AOO is very similar to VOO, but instead um, it's pacing in the atrium. It senses nothing in the ventricle and there's nothing to respond to, but if it was, it still would do nothing. So AOO just means I pace in the atrium no matter what at the set base rate. Um, so as you can see here, you have an atrial pace, you have a negative P wave, which indicates, um, you know, it's actually a paste, a captured atrial event. Um, it waits, times out, paces again, though no atrial intrinsic activities occurred or sensed by the device. Um, once again, these are EKGs, these are not EGMs, so we're not seeing what's happening in each chamber. Um, but the timer runs out, it paces, it captures, it conducts down to the ventricle, an atrial event occurs. The device is obviously blind, it doesn't sense it, so it paces anyway. It's functional non-capture here. Um, this one go ahead and conducts. This does nothing in the atrium. Um, the timer runs out. It paces again. So same thing with VOO. It's not really, um, you know, necessarily responding. It is not responding to what's going on in um, in the patient's, uh, you know, physiology physi physiologically. But it um, it does allow for. Um, support no matter what. So if you have a patient who has good conduction but is going in for surgery, AOO might be a good option. It can still be prorhythmic, but obviously kicking off AFib is um, a lot less dangerous than kicking off VFib. So uh, if you have a patient with good conduction, AOO is always you know an option if they're going into surgery or if you have a lot of atrial you know oversensing. It's it's a nice bridge here. Uh, any questions on that? AAI, similar to VVI, um, it allows the device to respond to the intrinsic atrial activity. Same thing as before, it has a timer. So it obviously is census event, it's withhold it, its entire pace. It senses again, it withholds its pace. And then the timer runs out, no atrial activity has occurred. So the device paces, you can see that it captures from the negative P wave, that isn't always an indicator, but in this case, it's a, it indicates it. Um, it the timer runs out, this one here, you know, you can see the P wave starting to begin and it's biphasic. You could argue this is a fusion. Um, it's a little hard to tell, to be honest with you, but I would say that the device either sensed it, sorry, let me go back, um, and it fused or we're having some degree of pseudo fusion where it's not capturing at all. Um, the timer runs out, no atrial activity occurs, it paces, you have this clear negative P wave, so it captures, and then you have these P waves occurring here, um, indicating that the patient, you know, it sensed the intrinsic activity and it withheld the pacing. All right, now we go to VDD. Um, so VDD, you will need either an atrial lead or you'll need, uh, I don't know if anyone else makes it yet, but Biotronic manufactures a lead that has a, let's see if I have a, I don't know if I can draw here. Yeah, okay. So you have your heart. I'm doing this with my right hand, so I apologize for my artistry. You have your lead going down into the ventricle. 
This is your RV, if you can't tell from this amazing diagram. Um, and you may have what is called a biotronic VDD lead. Dr. Dafe, we had this one um, the other day where, you, where we were a little confused by all the uh, extra little plugs here, but it allows you to actually sense in the atrium with an extra electrode here. So they have two electrodes actually that sense the atrial activity in addition to your ventricular um, electrodes. So the device isn't able to capture in the atrium, but it is able to sense the intrinsic um, activity in the atrium and respond accordingly. So if we're going through our NVG code, once again, we pace only the ventricle, but we sense in both the ventricle and the atrium and we respond based on this. So what can happen here is the device is able to modulate the rate or track the intrinsic atrial activity. So if the atrium speeds up, instead of the device um, you know, pacing only at the base rate, it will follow what it senses in the atrium. So here we have um, nothing has occurred, no, no P wave would sense. So it paces the base rate, same thing, paces the base rate. Here a P wave occurs, whether or not it responded accordingly, it might've undersensed it, but we pace. Here we have another P wave that comes earlier um, than it would normally pace. And the device senses the P wave and paces accordingly based on the AV delay. Uh, VDD pacing is probably one of the most complex when you talk about timing cycles, because it's like a, I don't know, we'll get into it at a later date, but um, that is the concept of VDD, is it allows you to pace um, the ventricle or modulate the rate based upon what's being sensed in the atrium. Any questions on that? Yeah, I was going to say, AJ, brilliant, yeah. And so as well as Biotronic, like, you know, Medtronic also do it. Um, and um, the <laughs> so the, the, the leads are called single pass leads. And we used to have a consultant who always used to use it for complete heart block for patients who were much, much older, like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and it has a VDD systems have a high rate of dislodgement or under sensing, like, like you, you showed there. So if that happens, then you simply just convert it to a VVI, like, like we see here um, um, intermittently. Um, so, um, yeah, so Medtronic also have, have, have their single pass leads. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, no, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't aware they, they had one yet. So, I mean, as you said, it, it's great for risk of occlusion um, or say the, you know, um, you can also set VDD in patients where you don't feel like you need to atrial pace. You don't have to use um, the single pass or the biotronic um, lead, you can actually program a dual chamber device uh, VDD as well. It just means you're not going to modulate the rate in the atrium. Um, here, I went ahead and just marked it. This looks like pseudo fusion. Um, the reason being, if you remember the definition of fusion is where you kind of have this hybrid between the intrinsic and the pace where it would be maybe a more narrow complex um, than the um, than the paced event, but not as narrow as the intrinsic. In this case, we see a pace here, sorry, but it looks like the complex has already started. And morphologically, it looks very similar to our previous intrinsics. It hasn't really contributed to the, uh, to the actual, um, you know, depolarization of the heart here. So it's pseudo fusion as in like, it looks like it fuses, but it really is not fusion at all. It, it just is functional non-capture. All right, now we go to DOO. DOO is like VOO or, or AOO, except we're pacing in both the atrium and the ventricle. We see atrial capture, we see ventricular capture, the timer waits. And obviously you have an atrial vent, you have a ventricular vent, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually sense it because it's set to none. The device then paces in the atrium and then it paces into the ventricle right here in the T wave. Um, which is one of you know the risks we talked about when you're using um, asynchronous modes is it could be pro-rhythmic pro here. So um, this is why whenever you're programming DOO, VOO, AOO, you always want to program uh, above the patient's intrinsic rate to not only suppress PVCs, but to risk or reduce the risk of pacing into vulnerable periods and kicking off arrhythmias. Um, so we pace, nothing happens, functional non-capture. We have a PVC. Once again, nothing happens. 
in the atrium. Well, we actually might have captured in the atrium. Who knows? It's hard to tell on this EKG. We have ventricular pace and the tissue was ready to respond. So it had left refractory and you end up actually capturing here. So PVC and then capture. The timer waits, paces again, capture in the atrium, capture in the ventricle. Um, timer waits, maybe fusion or pseudofusion in the atrium. You have this biphasic here. So it could be that, and then capture in the ventricle. Finally, the last one, P wave, functional non-capture in the atrium and functional non-capture in the ventricle morphologically is very similar to the intrinsic um, conduction. So we know that the device hasn't really contributed, um, but did run the risk of hyperrhythmic. Finally, so, DD. I, oh, yeah. so, sorry, AJ. So back, back to the D DO. <clears throat> So I remember Elvis asking a really good question mm. about the AV delay when and somebody is in surgery, how if, um, how much do you have to make it to stop competition coming through? And uh, mm. I thought I might remind you again to point it out. Yeah. Well, so uh, I typically go short AV delays to reduce that that risk. What, what do you typically set yours out? Yeah, fantastic. Exactly. As short as possible. If you if you see any competition coming, just make it short. Maybe about 100 and, 140 milliseconds, 100, 120 if you want, and uh -huh. just to rid any any kind of competition coming through, um, and that so that you might end up pacing the wrong. Yeah, yeah. So like, as he said, like, um, mm -hmm. as he said, this one right here, if you count it out, looks like around two hundred milliseconds, um, a little longer than we want for DOO. Um, as he said, you know one. 120, 150, 110, anything like that to reduce risk of uh, of pacing and making sure that you actually capture. So, yeah. All right. Uh, DDI. So, that is the next more complex version of dual chamber pacing. Once again, you are pacing in the ventricle and the atrium. You're sensing in both. And based upon what it senses, it inhibits behavior. Um, so, if you look at this D DDI programming, the timer paces or the timer starts, it paces. Uh, resets the atrial timer, it waits, it then paces the ventricle after a programmed AV delay, which is a little shorter than 200 milliseconds. It also resets the ventricular timer, which waits. This ventricular, or the atrial alert period waits, there's nothing that occurs, and we'll go over timing cycles later because they're very complex um, when you're first studying them. But uh, the atrial timer waits, no intrinsic atrial activity has occurred. So then it paces in the atrium, it waits its appropriate AV delay, um, the ventricular timer is timed out, no ventricular event occurs, and it paces as well. Uh, DDI is a modified ventricular-based timing, so um, it's technically based on the ventricular timing. We can go into details uh, on that later, but the big idea here we're looking for is that the device is, um, you know, it's, it's paying attention to what's happening in the atrium and the ventricle, and it's trying to respond appropriately by inhibiting uh, pacing. So uh, the timer is weighted in the atrium. An atrial event occurs, so it withholds the atrial place that would normally come across, and then it waits the appropriate amount of time in ventricular paces um, on the uh, like the uh, appropriate AV delay, and then ventricular paces after the event. So it probably senses the atrium here, waits its AV delay, and then paces in the ventricle. Uh, once again, an atrial event occurs. It sets the AV delay and then paces. Um, the idea being that the device is. Um, the device is kind of responding to intrinsic activity. We get here and it has waited and nothing occurs. Um, sorry, uh, the device is waited. It senses an intrinsic event. Um, it waits so long here, there must be some sort of kind of like VIP or MVP turned on to allow it to sense the intrinsic that came across. But um, yeah, that's that's DDI pacing. Any questions on that? Cool. Okay. Yeah. And then we get to DDD. So DDD is your gold standard. It is typically what you know you want to program patients to. Um, if capable, the idea is that you're paying attention to what's happening in both the atrium and the ventricle. You're pacing in both. You're sensing in both. And then based on what it senses, it uh, either inhibits pacing or it triggers pacing. It's a little more complicated when, it, when you talk about the triggering in the sense. But basically what it means is based on an atrial sensed event, it will uh, trigger the ventricular tracking of that um, atrial event. So you have here intrinsic atrial sense, 
The device withholds pacing in the atrium. In intrinsic ventricular, it withholds pacing. It resets its timers. Nothing occurs. It paces, sorry, paces in the atrium, which it captures. You see this negative P wave. And then the uh, ventricular event occurs, so it withholds pacing. It paces in the ventricle or paces in the atrium again. It captures, and then it um, nothing occurs based off its set AV delay. So it paces in the ventricle. Um, so the idea here is that as the atrial rate, you know, we're driving the atrial rate here in these instances, right? Atrial pace, atrial pace. As the atrial rate speeds up, though, the device will track that atrial rate, and that's where your trigger pacing comes. Uh, into play here. So when the atrial rate increases, the device says, even though my base rate is say 60 beats a minute, if the atrium is going 75, it will wait its appropriate AV delay, and then it will pace to follow along. Uh, this is great for patients who are chronotropically competent, meaning that their rate modulates based upon their physiologic demand. Um, say the patient is exercising, their atrium responds appropriately, the ventricular uh, pacing will also track that atrial, um, you know, that atrial rhythm, allowing the patient to get the cardiac output that they need. Uh, looks like we said, someone says, some atrial okay. pacing is always inverted P waves and not upright P waves. This has all been unipolar, hasn't it, so far? I've not. <clears throat> Sorry, we're, AJ, they're pacing without pacing spike. Um, I'm not sure yeah. what you mean by there's pacing without pacing spike on that. I think it probably means the ones that senses and doesn't pace. I've not seen any unless, unless, I don't know. So, um, yeah. AJ, yes, sir. Yeah, the question is on, you know, you have been showing uh, a pacing spike mm. to note that this is a pacing reading. Mm -hmm. But there are uh, uh, there are individuals who had pacemakers and the pacing is on, but you won't see these spikes. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that is what I want you to explain because the fellow going for West African National ECG of pacemaker can be given to them without mm -hmm. giving them because if you don't see this pacing spike, it may confuse you. So that is what I, I want you to say that. Explain it to explain it so that they can they can uh, uh, get it and know that not every pacemaker ECG mm -hmm. is identified with a pacing spike. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that's a really good point. I guess these are nice diagrams to show when the pacing occurs, but in reality, you on an EKG on a surface, you may not see pacing spikes. It depends on how high the amplitude is for your pace. Um, you know, and it just depends on the actual EKG machine itself, whether or not it picks it up. So, um, ways to tell, you know, you can go off morphology if, you know, the rate increases, but the morphology remains narrow complex, that could be intrinsic. Um, it's a little harder to tell in the atrium, to be honest with you. Um, I know Dr. Uh, Okonogu is asking about, is it always, you know, do you always have this negative, uh, P wave with atrial pace? I would say no, not always. I mean, you're the, Julius, you're the EKG expert, but remember we're looking at a surface EKG and if the atrial lead is pacing right next to where the sinus is, the depolarization is kind of moving in the same direction as a sinus event. Correct me if I'm wrong, Julius. I'm spot on, spot on. Yeah, so, so it could very much look like the intrinsic P wave. However, if the lead is kind of, you know, in a different position entirely, now the depolarization is moving in the opposite direction, um, which could result in a negative P wave. So you can't really go off of that. It's a good indicator in this specific case, but not for everybody. It really depends on atrial lead placement. It depends on EKG placement as well. So, you know, EKGs placed in a different fashion could end up um, looking very different. Um, but yeah, pacing spikes, once again, you can't trust them. So things to look for is how does the complex look? How fast is the heart rate going? If the patient has complete heart block and you see lots of wide complexes going at 70 beats a minute, you know, but this could be either pacing 
could also just be VT. Uh, there really isn't a great way to tell without interrogating the device. So, you know, looking at an EKG, interpreting what a device is doing is, is always helpful. Um, but it's it never beats actually interrogating the device and seeing what you know what the device is actually sensing and how it's acting. That makes sense. And also, you know, you have unipolar and bipolar pacing as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see the spikes on an ECG. You might not see the spikes. So good point. If if and it we'll is. Oh, sorry, a AJ, you go for it. Yeah. No, no, sorry, there you're done. Um, yeah. So as as Jules saying, say we have our our device generator here. We'll go over unipolar, bipolar at a different time. Let's say that's a pacemaker there. Unipolar, um, the electrons, regardless, let's not talk about current movement, but the electrons are running from the device to the tip of the lead versus bipolar. Uh, you're running from your anode to your cathode. Once again, electrons, not necessarily current. Um, are running from your anode to your cathode here. So um, you have a much smaller, um, you know, area inside the heart that you're pulsing with bipolar versus unipolar. It's going across tissue from the tip of the lead all the way to the device, the device to lead, if you're talking about electrons, um, which means that it makes a much larger signal um, being picked up by the device, which means you're more likely with unipolar pacing to see pacing spikes. All right. Rate responsive pacing. Um, you know, it's it's not new. 1988 was a, was a while ago, 35 years. Um, so basically what you know, what uh, rate responsive pacing is trying to mimic, you know, the, the intrinsic modulation of the patient's rate, uh, what their sinus node should be doing. Um, so patients who have chronotropic incompetence or a completely, you know, uh, dead atrium for lack of a better term, uh, this allows us to... Um, to kind of increase the rate based on the metabolic demand of the patient. Um, so when you're talking about rate responsive, you're just adding an R to the end of it. This just means that the sensor for AAIR, for example, the sensor is if it's like a, a piezoelectric sensor hooked up to a circuit board, kind of like a pedometer that measures your steps, that thing um, back in the day, they actually used like a casino ball. So it was like a little bitty metal ball that would bounce up and down based upon movement as well. And when this ball bounced up and down, that means the patient was moving. When the patient was moving, that indicates that they need to turn the rate up. Um, so that's when your rate modulation would take into effect. Whatever sensor they had, it um, detects the change in, or the need, possible need of rate increase and um, increases the rate appropriately. So say our base rate was 60, now the device is sensing uh, movement or activity, and it increases the rate um, accordingly. Uh, these things can be tricked. The casino ball one, um, if you're, you know, in a, on a roller coaster, your heart rates can increase because it's sensing the movement. Uh, you're going over a bumpy road in a car, things like that. Um, there's temperature based one. So like, for example, the Avera leadless device I told you about uh, bases on, on temperature. And when the blood temperature increases, um, it modulates the rate, um, sorry, when the blood temperature decrease, the initial decrease and then increase, which I can go over on a different day, but it, it basically um, detects the intrinsic activity um, and the metabolic demand and, and modulates the rate accordingly. This one can be tricked if you get in a hot tub, your heart rate will go up initially because the device will say, oh, you know, the blood temperature is increasing. They must have more metabolic demand. Let's increase the rate when in reality, you're just kind of hanging out in a hot tub. So um, not the best solution. You know, everything we're doing here with these devices is trying to trying to mimic the human heart. I don't think we've come up with a solution that's more effective than, you know, uh, what we were given to begin with, but we're just trying to get as close to a healthy human heart as possible. And that's where rate modulation comes into play. It's just trying to emulate that. VVIR, same thing, acts like normal VVI, but based upon the sensor's uh, indicated rate, it increases pacing appropriately. And then DD, DR, um, you know, same thing. So any one of those DDI, VOO, you add an R to the end, that just means that it's gonna modulate the rate based on what the sensor has indicated. 
So pacemakers are labeled to the highest level of mode they're capable of. So all these dual chamber devices will on the box say DDDR most likely, which means that they're capable of pacing in both the ventricle and atrium, capable of sensing in both, responding appropriately to both and uh, modulating rate based upon a sensor. That doesn't mean that is how it has to be programmed. Once again, you have a patient with AFib, you may program them VVIR which means that you're only paying attention to what's happening in the ventricle. Who cares what ha what's happening in the atrium? It's AFib. Um, you're only pacing in the ventricle. You're only sensing in the ventricle. You're only inhibiting in the ventricle and you're modulating the rate uh, based upon the sensor. So uh, once again, they're labeled based on the highest mode, but that is not what you program it. However, you do typically program it to the highest mode appropriate for that patient. So if a patient doesn't have AFib, if they do have some degree of chronotropic incompetence, you may program them DDDR. Things to keep in mind. Um, so considerations, what's the patient's underlying rhythm and overall cardiac condition, um, likelihood of disease progression, um, new rhythm disorders, benefits of one-to-one -one AV synchrony for the patient. So obviously, um, you know, you want to have synchrony with that atrial kick in the cardiac cycle that we talked about in previous lectures. Um, you want to kind of follow what the atrium is doing, not only because, you know, it, it gives the patient the best, um, you know, out, output for their metabolic demand, but it also ensures that you have that atrial kick of blood flow into the ventricle, swells the ventricle, and the device paces and pushes the blood out um, either systemically or, you know, to the lungs. Um, and then patient's overall condition, life expectancy, um, just things to keep in mind, and then also uh, cost and difficulty to implant. So some places may only do VVI devices because adding atrial leads is a little bit more complex. And if you haven't been trained on it, it may be better for the patient overall to have the most simple device to implant possible just for, um, you know, complication risk. Anything on that, Jules? Um, nice. It's, it's all good. Um, I'll ask you to, um, the rate response. Just, I mean, you covered accelerometer. It is a lot more. I mean, we'll probably cover it at a later date. Yeah. Um, but there are, yeah, there are minute, obviously, minute ventilation as well. Um, and um, close, close loop stimulation, which Biotronic tend to use as well. Um, the closed loop system is one example that you mentioned with the temperature as well. Um, so open loop is your accelerometer and your minute ventilation. So this this is those who are going to do their IBHRE and things that um, obviously you, you can have an input from an outside, whereas your closed loop is your internal systems that changes it. So your temperature is one example, your metabolic changes um, increase your temperature. Um, your The one that Biotronic uses is your um, um, RV impedance, which me measures your contractility, makes changes to that. Um, so for instance, which is why it's really good for vasovagal syncope, when people have a sudden drop in change, sudden drop in rate, um, it would detect normally your heart tries to compensate by um, contracting very rapidly. So algorithms like that are very, very handy for that. They will detect when your contractility changes the impedance, which will end up increasing the base rate, maybe 20 beats per minute higher than that, and it prevents you from having syncope. So for those who are doing IBHRE, like there's a, there's a, um, the rate response uses, um, there's a closed loop, closed loop system and an open loop system. So you can look into that and we can talk about that much more later on. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. No, that's that dead on. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's it's good to kind of specify the difference. Um, open loop systems were just the baseline. That's what we had to begin with. And then closed loop obviously is more responding to um, you know, the own the own human body's, you know, need as opposed to just basing it off of an external feature like a casino ball roller and sensing movement. So um, closed loop is definitely seems to be the future and where everything is trending or at least some sort of hybrid closed loop um, uh, system. So I, I appreciate you uh, going over that for me. Um, so why VVI? Uh, so VVI offers advantages. One, it's, it's simple, easy to implant. Sorry. Um, obviously it offers ventricular pacing support. A lot of people enjoy that. 
Um, it's very easy to uh, to see what's going on. So there's only one pacing spike, or as Dr. Adafe pointed out, there may not be a pacing spike, but there's only one chamber you're really trying to keep track of. Um, it's very cost effective. It's the cheapest one to put in. You pay for one lead. The devices are typically a little bit cheaper. Um, and like I said, it's simpler to implant. But the big problem is loss of AV synchrony. So if you have a patient with a healthy atrium and you're putting in a VVI device, you're robbing them of AV synchrony, which can you know, they're not, they're not going to have this chronotropic response. Um, they're not going to have that atrial kick, which is 20 to 30% of their output. So if you can put a dual chamber device in a patient that does have intrinsic or does have an intrinsic or healthy atrium, that would be the recommendation. Um, for patients with AFib, it's not really necessary. We know what's going on and it's not a lot in the atrium. So why a dual chamber? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, go for it. That was, that was a big issue. Um, I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but um, um, so no, 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 no. Um, so we know we know a place where um, a lot of single chambers are being implanted, like in the past, mm. um, when a dual chamber was really indicated. You know, so like AJ mentioned, like um, there has to be the right indication has to be matched um, by the right pacemaker implantation. Otherwise. If you put a VVI system in a sinus rhythm um, patient, then you could induce things like a pacemaker syndrome things, um, which has a whole list of symptoms that they can, and patients, some some patients, they get really dizzy with that um, and things like that. So yeah, sorry, AJ. No, yeah, I actually, I, that's a good call. I didn't mention pacemaker syndrome. Uh, do you want to kind of elucidate a little bit more on that or expand a little bit more on that? So, so if somebody has has a um, it's in sinus rhythm, and you put a VVI system in, and say for instance, like you're pacing them at like sixty or seventy beats per minute, and and yeah, so every time their sinus rate is always almost like competing with the rate that you set their um um um, um pacemaker at. So it's pacing around about sixty, eighty beats per minute. Their sinus rate is maybe around about the same. Um, so what's happening is that every time you pace um, and the valve, obviously the tricuspid valve is closed um, um, or is open even, and then the heart, you're pacing and contracting um, against like a, a closed valve. Um, so there's no atrial contribution to the ventricles per se. Um, so what happens, the valve is closed, the atrial contracts and um, the pressure that's induced in the atrium is um, being transmitted back through the um, carotid veins. So you get what you call your um, canon waves, for instance, and older, older people tend to get that anyway um, because they've got AF and various things. There's a dyssynchrony um, between the atrial and atrial and the ventricle. Um, you also, you see one example is you put in um, a VVI pacing, um, you get a pacemaker syndrome. Um, you can also, you get that with complete heart block as well, because um, there is the ventricle um, contracting against um, the atrial contracting when the valves are actually closed, the tri tricuspid valve is closed. So the pressure within the atrium is transmitted backwards through the veins, and then you get like um, um, cannon waves um, in, in, your, in your neck. And um, so then you get neck distension and that a lot of older people have that. That's why the neck actually distends. Um, but that comes with a whole load of symptoms. People get really breathless. They get um, dizzy. Um, I think people can even get syncope. Um, you know, it can lead to heart failure. It can lose all sorts of things. A whole list of symptoms that you get with that. Yeah, I think that I think it's dead on is that, you know, it's your atrium is squeezing against that that closed valve and you end up with the backflow. Um, I, and you're the physiologist on this, so I'll defer to you. I think there's also issues where if the valve is open because of the atrial kick, you can get like jets as well. Correct. Yeah. The ventricle squeeze, yeah. the ventricular squeeze. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, I mean, it's basically you're just you're not you're not functioning the way the heart should or, or more distant from what the heart should be functioning. Like I said, everything we're trying to do is, is to, um, is to, you know, mimic the own intrinsic, uh, natural, healthy human heart. So, um, anything that we can do to ensure that we have AC, AV synchrony is, is always preferable. So yeah, that's, I appreciate you kind of going on pacemaker syndrome. You may have that. Um, I appreciate that Julius, cause you may have patients that complain about it and you can see their, you know, pulsation. 
So, um, all right. So dual chamber pace, uh, pacing, why do we like it? Well, it maintains one-to-one -one AV synchrony. Every atrial event has a corresponding ventricular beat, uh, follows atrial kick. So you get 20 to 30% um, cardiac uh, output improvement. That's kind of your Frank Starling law. For those of you taking the IBHRE, um, you're going to want to study that a little bit. But basically what, what's that saying is that, you know, a muscle fiber when it's stretched allows it to, um, to squeeze with more force. Uh, essentially, it's just like if you're throwing a baseball, if you shot put it, you're not going to throw it as far as if you stretch your arm back and kind of whip it out. It's the same mechanism here. Stretching a muscle fiber uh, more before it before it contracts allows for more contractility. More contractility means more cardiac output as well. So these kind of work together in that aspect. Mimics a healthy heart. It's all we're trying to do. Prevents pacemaker syndrome dead on, as uh, as Jules explained. Um, so the question you should always ask is, is it possible to get AV synchrony? If they're an AFib, no, you know, permanent AFib. If they have intermittent, you know, atrial fibrillation, then you might want to consider an atrial lead. Um, but things to consider, there's more hardware, costs more, um, not, a, not a lot, but a little more. Um, and it's more complex to implant, more complex to interpret as well. All right, uh, dual chamber pacing. Once again, two leads. How are we doing on time? Oh, well. Um, <laughs> we may need to uh, to truncate this last portion. I don't know how everyone feels about it. But uh, two leads, one in the atrium, one in the ventricle, two channels, um, atrial ventricular timing cycles is what it has. It does everything that a single chamber pacer can do, but it allows for AV synchrony. Um, I don't know. How, how does everyone feel? Do we want to continue on? We have another 20 slides. This could take another 30 minutes to an hour. We can always pick this up on a later date, I feel like. Jules, you got an opinion? Um, man, well, I don't mind. But... Having a little trouble. Hey, Dr. Duffy, having a little trouble understanding you. Can you uh, put it in the chat? I said Sorry? how many slides? Remaining how many slides? Uh, yeah, about 20. Why don't we um, Why don't we open it up to questions? I feel like we covered a lot. Yeah, um, we have because, actually. Yeah, it gets, okay. yeah, looking at these slides, it's pretty complex. Yeah. Um, so why don't we open this up to questions today? And we will pick this up on a on a later day. Um, so does anyone have any questions off the bat for me? Anything at all? We covered quite a bit. It was relatively simple, but for people new to pacing, I I empathize because it's it's a difficult concept to understand, but it, it'll all make sense someday. So anything for me? Jules, you got anything you want to add? I just got a phone call, AJ. So I missed that. Um, no, I think I think I think you've covered all the points. I think you've done. I think this is even better than um, the presentation that you had of this. Um, was it a year ago, AJ? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it was la last January. Yeah. Last January. I think it's really good. It's really comprehensive. You've kind of tied everything together. Um, you know, you've explained okay. um, the need. I, I, I think this is really really good, and you've covered all the points. Um, unless unless somebody else has got that question, I think you've really covered everything, like at the basics. Um, so that, that that's pretty good, really, really good. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to the group, once again, um, you know, I think the most complex stuff we really talked about was the um, was dual chamber pacing DDDR. Um, and DDD uh, pacing timing cycles. So we're going to obviously do a much deeper dive into how the device senses, how those functions work. So if you didn't get it, trust me, we didn't really get into it. So um, there's a lot more to cover and how that all works and the minutia behind, you know, sensing and, and pacing algorithms. But we want to kind of give you an early taste of it. And then we'll, we'll cover it at a later segment. So if you do have questions in the meantime, you know, feel free to reach out in the chat and, and ping us with anything you have or uh, message us directly on the masterclass group. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put this on YouTube. And just an FYI to everyone, 
Um, we are going to be migrating YouTube to this Cardiovascular Education Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, just for simplicity's sake, I was kind of posting it on my own here, but we're in the process of moving all of our old videos to the Cardiovascular Education Foundation's channel. Um, so anything new moving forward will be on there, especially this, which is underneath a podcast um, on that channel to answer you know, anything you have, feel free to, to subscribe or please do subscribe. So you get the most up-to-date events, um, comments, any questions you have, you know, we're here to help. We do have a hand raiser. We did, but they disappeared. Who do we have? Oh, Dr. Dafe. Let's see if I can give you permission to talk. Okay. There you go. Dr. Daffey had something. How do we assess cardiovascular education? You, oh, access. Um, so how do we access the cardiovascular education YouTube? Um, so if you just search for that on Google, the Cardiovascular Education Foundation, um, it or it'll be there under YouTube. But I will also po post it into the master class group as well. So similar to the one we had before, it's just a different YouTube channel. Um, the reason being, we get special rates as it being a nonprofit, and we're trying to make this our house. Um, you know, for all of our cardiology education um, needs moving forward. So I will post that to you and you'll be able to follow it. It'll be in the masterclass group or just Google it, Cardiovascular Education Foundation. And it has their little icon. Uh, Dr. Dafe, did you have a question? You had your hand raised. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if we can hear you. I can't hear you personally. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Okay. So I was talking about spike and no spike. Mm. The the un, uh, the unipolar um, uh, uh, leads, they will give you a spike because you need uh, the can to complete the circuit. And uh, if you take the can out of the body, that person will not hold. So the spikes takes a long route because from uh, the the but from the cardiac muscle to the uh, tissue and get to the can to complete the circuit. So you have spikes in unipolar uh, pacemakers. That is, uh, yeah, unipolar pacemakers will give you a lot of uh, spikes. But for bipolar, the anode and the cathode are within the lead. The distance is not. Uh, it just from the uh, from the anode to the cathode is just very few millimeter. So most time you may not get that spike because it takes a very short uh, distance to complete this uh, the circuit. You don't need a can to complete the circuit at that point. So in that case, you will just see the uh, the pacing without the um, without the. Uh, the artificial uh, spikes that usually accompany, I mean, uh, a strike that starts before the uh, the the pacing. So this is what I was trying to figure. Uh, uh, I want. I was trying to drive out. But we should also know that a patient may have uh, LBB on his own because if an ECG is given to you, is he a pacemaker ECG? If you don't see the spike, because if a patient is on um, uh, is pacing from the right um, uh, from the right ventricle, that patient is going to generate uh, LBB on the ECG. So if um, and also a patient may on his own have an um, uh, LBB without a pacemaker. So how do you distinguish it? That is what what you said now comes in that you have to interrogate the device and you have to figure, have more details about the patient to know all this about the patient. So, but only ECG, is it LBB? Is it pacemaker induced LBB or an LBB from heart failure or other causes? The question is, looking at only the ECG may be confusing because you may not get any of the spikes. Mm -hmm. So that's that's dead on. So I think one of the most important things you mentioned early there um, is it will not capture unipolar if it's not in the pocket. And we'll cover this later, but 
Um, yeah, if you're set unipolar pacing and you take the can out of the pocket, the device yes. no longer can capture it's, it's, it. All. Yeah, it just go to the native rhythm. It will not capture it. Exactly. So it, it takes it out of the mm -hmm. equation. What you can do is soak it in a wet rag, like wrap in a wet rag, or touch it to the open pocket or touch it to a piece of metal that's touching the open pocket. And as long as you have a sufficient enough output, um, like voltage output, you should be able to capture. But if you just pull it out, you lose capture and you lose for the device's ability to sense as well. Yeah. Um, if you're set unipolar. Um, other things you're talking about, um, you know, LBB, uh, so RV pacing looks similar to LBB, uh, left bundle branch block, absolutely dead on here. So if you think about it, if they have a left bundle branch block at baseline, say this is their under, other bundle branch, and this, the electrical impulse is not able to go down the left side, it only goes down the right. At baseline, it's going to look very similar to RV pacing. Because if you think about it, you have that RV impulse either pacing from the septum or the apex where it's placed, or the intrinsic induction, it's all moving from the rights to the left, elect, um, the electrical impulse. So you end up looking much like a left bundle. So if you have a patient with an existing left bundle, pacing could look very similar to their left bundle intrinsic conduction. So dead on there. Spot on, yep. Excellent. So the, the, the best thing to do is to interrogate the device <laughs> yeah. interrogate the device and that that will give you the answer um yeah it will give you the answer and uh, there are other things uh, uh if a patient comes to you you can also ask the patient where is your uh, uh where yeah. is it uh did you do any procedure was there any problem uh was um do you have a card uh, that was given after the procedure all the stuff uh, those are a preliminary point to get more information from the patient. Then you can interrogate. That's yeah, so important to to make sure patients have proper documentation. And when you implant, you know, as as Dr. Dafe has done and um, Ola Demeji is, you know, giving patients a card or something indicating what kind of device they have, because there's yes. nothing worse than a patient shows up and we don't even know what device they have, and then you just pretty much have to start interrogating and hope that you're able to interrogate it with one of the programmers you have on hand. Um, yeah, so documentation exactly. is key and make sure the patients know what they have. Yeah. So th this is this is reminding me of a really important stuff, which I've been meaning to speak to you about, AJ. So I think, Dr. Oladjimi, you should have it or maybe not. So, and um, I'm not sure if Dr. Daffy, you have it on your smart sync um, um, iPad. So I downloaded like a, a virtual um um, I am an app which enables you to so once a patient comes into your hospital you don't you it's not your patient it's coming from somewhere else um, and then you don't know they don't have any idea on them and um, you can't do an x-ray um, and the x-ray picture there's an app that you can point to the x-ray that can guess the manufacturer of that device as well um, and yeah. it's it's it, oh. I mean, some people doubt his accuracy. I don't know, AJ, if you've used it. <laughs> I, I've used it. No, I definitely have used it before. Um, and it, it's it's helpful. It really is. Because it'll give you a percentage, right? It, it yes. kind of like looks at it and says, like, I'm 90% sure this is St. Jude, 20% sure it's Boston. And it could save you some time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I don't know if you have it. You could you can download it if you want. I, I'll try and get, get it for you and send it to you. Um, no problem. Daffid and Dr. Lajmi, that would be very good. And the other point as well, AJ, are you able to go back all the way to where we had the BPEG, NASPI BPEG, um, um, nomenclature, the naming, yeah. pacing codes? Got it. There you I go. just remembered it, actually. So, so this, this is a really good point, a really important point to everyone listening. So especially when Pace for Life are dealing with reconditioned devices, so um, the Medtronic ones that are coming, um, I've been programming ODO, ODO. Um, so when you get it in ODO, make sure, so that is not gonna, it's not gonna pace. It's not gonna pace by like EJ cycling here. Um, it depends on what you put a sensitivity, but I've had, and it's not gonna respond to anything. So if, for instance, if, you, if you're doing a box chain and things ODO and you put it, nothing will happen. It won't do anything. So 
make sure that you interrogate your device first, put it in the mode that you want, check the battery, make sure there's enough battery in it, um, acceptable battery, and then put it in the correct mode. Um, and then also very, very important, like Dr. Daffy mentioned that, and I have seen it programmed to unipolar sensing mm -hmm. and pacing. Or pacing, yeah. Yeah, so, so like make sure that you check everything. And as I said, this is really important because we're dealing with reconditioned devices here and they're always putting audio and sometimes they change it to unipolar pacing, unipolar mm -hmm. sensing and that. So, and make sure the output is enough as well. The pacing output is enough because sometimes they put it to really, really low and they put the sensing to um, really, really like low, which is a high value. And that so make sure you put them uh, values that are acceptable before you do your pay, you do your implant procedure, whether you do box change or or new or whatever. So I thought I, I remember this when we were doing it, AJ. I thought this would be really important, especially when we deal with reconditioned devices when you put in that. That's, yes. No, that's... In addition, uh, in addition, very correct. Um, when you pick the reconditioned device, as uh, Julia just said, and you want to make use of it. You first of all uh, put the the header on the programmer, put the header on the device, and open the device. As you open the device, it will tell you ODO for a dual chamber uh, uh, device. So you go to Metronic Get, as it's Julius that taught me all this. You go to Metronic Get. When you get to get, you will see Metronic Nominas. Then you click on Nominas Set Pending and you program it. Once you program it, it comes to more or less the factory setting for that particular, uh, the device comes back to the Metronic Nomina at implant. Now, another thing again, you check, um, check, the the uh, the polar uh, the polarity is it bipolar or unipolar? If it is programmed, because some of the uh, this azure, they can come as they can they may have be programmed as unipolar. If it is unipolar, take note of that as we have just been repeating over and over. Because as you hold the device and you connect it, it's still in your hand. You connect it. You have already. Um, you have already uh, positioned the leads and you have tested the leads and they are all fine. You position, you connect it and screw it as long as it's in your hand, it's not going to activate any pacing. So you have to drop it in the pocket before you see the pacing coming up because it is unipolar. So you have already had all those information in your mind already. So you are not worried because you know what you are dealing with. So these are the key things to implant all these uh, reconditioned devices. So once you connect, if it is um, if it is unipolar, I don't have, if it is set unipolar, I don't advise you to go and program it to be bipolar. If you program it as bipolar. And by the time you are implanting, you get to the point of using the, the lead, you open the lead and you connect, it has already changed itself to the unipolar. Uh, it has happened to me where I saw <clears throat> when I when I went to get and program uh, pending, I went to program me, programmed, uh, programmed it, and I went to unip uh, the unipolar. I said, no, I don't like unipolar. Let it be bipolar so that when I connect, it will automatically uh, uh, start pacing. And I program it back to bipolar. So what happened was that I used the device. I got to the point of uh, taking the, uh, the battery, connected screw. I did not see any pacing. So what I did, I said, ah, this guy has this, this device has returned back. So I put it in the pocket immediately. As I put into the pocket, few seconds after that, <clears throat> the pacing started. So <clears throat> then I close, connected back. I I close, then uh, put my plaster. Then uh, took the programmer back, and I noticed back it has on its own went back 
to Unipolar. So these are the key things to implant these uh, reconditioned devices. If you are dealing with um, the ones that we usually have here, that is uh, the Sphera. Sphera, uh, I have not seen any Sphera that comes in, um, in Unipolar. Uh, for the past five years, all the Sphera I've seen are more of uh, a bipolar. That is the, uh, the the new devices. They are more of bipolar. So once you have this, you won't have any problem in getting the device implanted. Yeah. So can I can I really quickly say, answer yeah. to that, Dr. Daffy? Is that in Medtronic, the Medtronic device that I'm speaking about, <clears throat> so to um, program off the lead polarity switch, auto switch, yeah. Auto switch is on, which is why it reverts back to the, Well, that was why it reversed. Oh, reverse. very correct. So you yeah. can go back into parameters and there should be lead polarity mm -hmm. there. That something has got an adaptive monitor or whatever. Then you can change it from that. You can change oh, it. Oh, fine. Off. Fine. And then it won't yes, switch sir. it. It won't switch it in that. Mm -hmm. so, so just, just, for, just, for the, just for this. Just for this. And then once the device is in, you can program it back into that yes so because people sounds... the unipolar i don't have problem yeah go ahead mm. aj no it, it almost sounds like jules then it, it sounds like it's an idiosyncrasy of the device not knowing that it's being re-implanted yeah uh, exactly. because i'm sure the polarity mode switch like polarity switch is off before the device has ever been hooked to a lead but having been hooked to a lead previously and then unhooked the device is probably All checking right. its impedance and thinking oh i'm not you know something's wrong let me switch polarity so What's yeah, I, Abbott does have the polarity switch as well. I would have to do some digging to see the the default, but I've never seen this behavior. But that's that's a good one to to note because I um, yeah I haven't seen that specifically, but that would obviously very very surprising in an implant. <laughs> and, um, and and incidentally, so uh, uh, um, so this is a really good point. So the other thing is when you get reconditioned devices and it's got like a high impedance or greater than 3,000, like, trend, leading pattern trend on it, and it's still on it. Sometimes when you do this very thing, when you go into a lead polarity switch and, and put it off, and it, it actually erases it. So sometimes that erases that high impedance history trend, mm. which still sort of rolls over onto the near, next patient. It, it removes it. So we've managed to do it. I think once or twice, Dr. Daffy it doesn't do it for all of them. Depends on you what you are right, but, mm. uh, and, and which was amazing because it's really annoying. Yeah, to yeah. Have a high impedance showing up on it, and this was a question on Pace for Life a long time ago that we we're trying to resolve it. I kind of accidentally stumbled on it. The answer, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it works for some, not all of them. So yeah, so that's really, really useful stuff. Actually, really, really good stuff. Thank yeah, you. No, very good stuff. Very good stuff. <laughs> it makes your PC very simple. <laughs> uh, no, so that's it's interesting. And another thing to keep in mind with Avid devices, I'm not sure about Medtronic, is that you will have the triggers will be turned off as well. So when your lead impedance trend exceeds greater than 2000, it may turn off the trigger. So in the future, if there's a lead problem, if the episode trigger has been ticked off, so that's something you probably want to turn on. And it's just these are little idiosyncrasies that come with DV device reprocessing. Mm -hmm. So, um, really quick, so ben, just AJ, AJ, sorry, I uh, the even the uh, the Sphera, the new Metronic uh, devices, the Sphera. If you look at their EP, uh, impedance, what uh, before it was two thousand, but what we usually see now is more of uh, uh, three thousand. I don't know whether Julius uh, um, can comment on it because our several occasions. We have turned from three thousand to uh, to two thousand as upper uh, upper limits. Yeah, so that that used to be the sort of range, like from two hundred ohms to three thousand yeah. ohms for Medtronic, and then some of them you can actually change from two thousand down to two thousand or one thousand five hundred. Um, so I think I think some of the newer ones doesn't even allow you to do that, but um, but most of them you should be able to change it from three thousand to two thousand. But I mean, yeah. it's, it's just the range in which it won't allow the if there's any lead fracture or anything, it will obviously shoot mm -hmm. off 
um, well, well, well over um, the normal range, and it will basically yeah. detect and highlight the problem. But um, mm. some of them allows you to obviously change it to two thousand. Um, most of them it should allow you to do that. But um, I have mm. noticed one or two that doesn't. Um, it doesn't allow you to change from three thousand to two thousand. Yeah, you're right. Um, is that is that what you mean? Yes, correct. So rarely, too, you know, the difference between two and three thousand, the lead is probably not functioning too well anyway <laughs> at that impedance. But I have seen instances where you have a very low impedance and the lead still functions. So, for example, once again, I'm talking Abbott because that's the one I use. I I program. Um, if your impedance value is stable at 180 ohms, but the trigger is 200, you can lower the trigger and just say, let's continue to monitor it. If it drops more, we can react. So that's kind of the programming appropriately. Um, okay. there. So really quick, just to reiterate what Dr. Dafe said, um, you know, uh, things to pay attention when implanting a device um, is the mode it's at. So if the patient's dependent, I would recommend DOO um, for the mode switch, just because when you're using the electric artery, you can cause inhibition in the device. It could oversense, you know, the um, cartery as an intrinsic signal and withhold pacing. We'll cover all this later, but just to give you a heads up, um, outputs, kick your outputs to five volts um, or so, depending on what the intrinsic or the, the original was. I always just go high output just in case. And then polarity, pay attention to polarity. There may be nothing you can do about it and be ready for it to auto polarity switch. But it sounds like, as Julius said, you can turn the trigger off. But if for some reason it's not pacing, put it in the pocket or put it against something metal in the pocket, and that may resolve it. Um, if you're not DOO and the pay device is not pacing, pay attention to the fact that like noise could be creating issues. Um, also, when you're first connecting a new device or a reprocessed device to a lead, um, pay attention to noise on the EGM channels as well, because you don't want it to be oversensing noise and inhibition. Catch it early, because it could just be a simple where the lead is not fully pushed in. There could be a little gunk on the lead, so you want to make sure the lead tip is cleaned off before plugging into the header. Um, and then make sure your set screw is tight all the way as well. Um, and once you eliminate those, if you're still seeing noise, it's maybe a bigger issue. Uh, we did have a question on the Q&A. What of threshold sensing trends? Is there a way to clear that out too? Um, uh, Jules, you want to take that one with Medtronic? I don't I don't know if there's a way to clear the old trends. Um, no, I've not. I've only done it for the impedance. Um, mm. I think the ones that were able to clear from the appearance, probably should clear the threshold, but I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Doctor Daffy, you you might know this. I'm not sure. Can you clear the old threshold trend from the previous um, previous history of the pacemaker? I I I have. Maybe we can have a look next time. Yeah, Doctor, we can have a look next time and see. If if you can't, I think this is really important. Why you should always fill out the patient information and implant information. So yeah, make sure, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I didn't know. I, uh, I I muted myself, so I wasn't. I wasn't when I was talking. I was not hearing myself. So, um, when a, re a, a reconditioned device is implanted, you have to check everything, even the patient detail, date of implant. You have to change all those things because the previous the the day that was there, the day that will be there will be the previous date. Of that, of that, when that device was implanted, then the date of the patient, the age of the patient that formerly used it, all those information will still be there. So you have to erase all that and put in everything new. And um, I've done a lot of programming with Julius, where we 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 because you went back to uh, uh, to Metronic uh, nomina. Then sometime we will store it and come back to try to erase. Julius knows what, what we did there. We come back, he will erase, and you say, okay, leave it over time. And after a while, you notice that the previous um, the previous records will be erased and the new records will be kept from uh, for that patient. So we have, we have done a number of it here. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Daffy. And the other thing, I've just had a thought, the person who asked that question, how mm -hmm. about trying, go into the um, pacing output, um, you know, um, atrial and ventricular, and try and change the um, um, adaptive capture management, put it off, mm -hmm. 
and then okay. put it back on and then put it back on again. yes those and are part of what we read the history mm. of all the threshold the previous threshold and everything yes yeah, yeah. it, it, it may not erase it immediately Julius, it okay. may not take it out immediately, but by the time the patient is coming back to you, it okay. has it has cleared out. Okay. okay. Yeah, it might not in that session, but the next session you interrogated the session. session. Yeah. 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 Well, um, mechanic. So, oh, sorry, I was going to say. As Dr. Duffy said, just make sure if you put in the, the new implant date, then at least you have a reference point. You can see, okay, this, because all the charts are marked with the actual dates. So you can see if it was implanted in February 2023, and this is from, you know, January 2020, this is irrelevant data and just go from whatever the implant date was on. So it's it's so important to put the documentation in the device, because remember, you may not be the one to follow up with this patient. So the proper mm -hmm. information, you know, any kind of pertinent details. So I always put in the notes of the device itself, whether or not they're dependent. Um, whether or not there's abandoned leads, all of these things that like could save us a lot of trouble down the road, known issues with leads. If we know there's atrial lead noise or ventricular lead noise below a certain level, what could happen is a physiologist or a different physician could check it later and say, oh, why is the sensing so high, which we'll go over later? Why is the sensitivity threshold so high? And it could be very well intentionally programmed, but if they don't know the history, they're going to change it to whatever they feel is appropriate. So please always leave details in the devices. Um, you know, I, I always stress that when I worked in the field as well, as more more detail is always better. So, sorry, Jules, you were saying? No, no that's, that's fantastic, yeah. Um, I was gonna say Medtronic actually generally clears out um, after, an, after an hour um, since the last interrogation. So mm -hmm. this is more to do with arrhythmia storage and things like that. Um, but I think if you change the um, adaptive ca capture management and 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 then you end the interrogation, uh, you change it to you know from adaptive to off, and then put it, and then you end the interrogation and then go back maybe after an hour or so. I think that should clear it. Um, I think after an hour, um, it clears all the like storage arrhythmia storage. Uh, yeah, Julius. Yeah. yeah, Julius. Evis, Evis also have some experience is sh uh, sharing it on the chat. Can oh. you read it oh, for nice us? One. Yeah, Elvis is saying, um, so the threshold trend clears out over time. Um, there is usually a gap in the threshold trends from the last patient to the new patient. So you can tell the previous That's trend correct. from the previous patient. Yes, yes. Perfect. Good. Thanks, Elvis. Good. Get on. Fantastic. Um, I think we covered a lot. Actually, I'm glad we took the took a break to to chat. So, um, how's everyone looking? Anything else you want to chat about? Or we, uh, if not, we'll call it a week and we'll see you next weekend. Brilliant, AJ. That, that was that was really useful. That was really good stuff. That was great. Okay. I yeah, I appreciate everyone's time. I will not necessarily be around next weekend. I, I think we're we're flying out. So. Um, you know, someone else will be picking up uh, from here and we'll kind of expand on what we're, you know, continuing to build. If you have specific questions about what we've already talked about or suggestions on what we can talk about in the future, feel free to ping us and send it to us. We are creating this curriculum and we're trying to, as we said, build this, um, this uh, education on one another. So if you once again, if it if it seems easy now, just stick with us. We're going to get into more complex subjects. And if you feel like you're getting lost along the way, reach out. We're here to help. You know, we're we're super excited to have so much engagement from across the continent and so many skilled people who are trying to to get more involved in device implants and patient management. So anything that we can do to help, you know, that's what we're here for. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and it's uh, been great having you. Excellent. Thanks, AJ. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Duffy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Julius. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, AJ. Cheers.